morning, everybody. Welcome back. We're, we're glad that you could join us this morning. Tune in and uh, enjoy the music today and the message by Ronnie.
take it away, Ronnie. Y'all cannot imagine what it's like to be here recording these with Garrett. Just me and him in this room. Lots of dad jokes, that's all I got to say. But there is something you can't imagine. Imagine, if you would, a very hot, muggy August day. Not too many days in the future. It's a small Gulf Coast town, not unlike our own. It's about 95 degrees, high humidity. Huge billowing clouds hang in the blue sky. The wind is stiff and fiery, but there is hardly a leaf rustling in the trees because there are very few leaves left on the trees. That's because a Category 3 or a Category 4, God forbid, a Category 5 hurricane has made landfall a day earlier. There's no power, no air conditioning, very little ice, no gasoline, extensive damage, and very few injuries, thankfully, because Everyone heeded the evacuation orders and skedaddled just in the nick of time. Now you know you're imagining when you think everyone evacuated. <laughs> we don't have to imagine that scene. We've all lived through it here. Arriving on this scene of devastation is the FEMA Regional Director for the Southeastern United States. He and his team have been prepping at the Federal Regional Response Center in Thomasville, Georgia, and now that the storm has passed, they are here with their boots in the sand. They set up assistance stations. They search destroyed homes. They coordinate <coughs> and command with local and state authorities. They begin taking applications for federal assistance. They hold news conferences and they eat at the local Waffle House. In times of disaster in the southeastern United States, whether it be hurricanes or tornadoes or floods, FEMA now invokes what they call the Waffle House Index, and I am not kidding. This index was informally adopted after the severe hurricane seasons of the early 2000s. FEMA workers noticed that there was a direct correlation between the operations of the local Waffle House and how bad conditions actually were on the ground. Former FEMA Administrator Craig Fugate said afterward, if you get to the scene of a disaster and the Waffle House is closed, then you know it's really bad. That's where you have to go to work. So this three-tiered Waffle House Index was developed as an unceremonious way of assessing storm damage. Code green, the Waffle House has power, it is staffed and is serving a full menu. This means that damage is localized to a small area or overall damage is limited. Code yellow, the Waffle House has sketchy or generated base power. The menu is limited to only a certain few items. And this means the damage is more extensive and covers a greater area. A more robust response will be required. And code red, the Waffle House is closed. This means the damage somewhere in that affected region is catastrophic. And it was just a couple of years ago when Hurricane Michael made landfall in Bay County that Code Red was in fact employed in Bay County because the region was struck so badly by that hurricane. Why choose the Waffle House for this index? Well, they're always open. And if they are not, something is obviously wrong. But more to the point, the Waffle House has a very simple, uncomplicated, unsophisticated operational plan. There are very few moving parts. Food, less than a half dozen workers fulfilling only three major roles. Power, gas, water. And if they have these things, they are in business even without some of these things, even without power, without a full staff, without all the necessary items to round out a complete menu, the doors will open and the coffee will be pouring. This is the third course in this meal we have been digesting the last few weeks by video, the gospel according to Waffle House. <clears throat> and today's heaping helping is about simplicity. I'll be reading again from Romans 15. This is verses 20 through 21 as the Apostle Paul talks about his work. 
Paul writes and says, My ambition has always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard, rather than where a church has already been started by someone else. I have been following the plan spoken of in the scriptures where it says, those who have never been told about him will see, those who have never heard of him will understand. I want us to think about simplicity today along three lines, and Paul's words will guide us. First, simplicity as a, as a philosophy, as a way of living. One could say that Paul is a reductionist. For all of his prolific writings and wordiness at times, when pushed to answer the biggest questions, he reduces the complex to simpler and more fundamental elements. I'll return to this in the theological view of simplicity in a moment, but philosophically, Paul flattens things out. Our vocation, our calling, our purpose, our life as the church together, really, he tries to keep as modest as possible. There was a Franciscan priest during the high Middle Ages. His name was William Ockham, or William of Ockham. And his ideas that he came up with a thousand years ago still bear fruit today. And his main principle is something you may have heard of, referred to as Occam's Razor. And it can be applied to mathematics, philosophy, government, management, science, religion. It goes like this. All things being equal, the simplest solution is the best solution. Put another way, one should always opt for an explanation in terms of the fewest possible factors. Albert Einstein, the most intellectual man this world has seen in centuries, said it like this, any intelligent fool can make things more complex. It takes a touch of genius to move toward simplicity. He would later write that true brilliance is the simplicity found on the other side of complexity after one has worked through all the complications saying quote the one who understands a subject best is the one who can explain it the plainest we use philosophical simplicity all the time we don't even think about it here's a common example that i remember right from a college philosophy class about occam's razor of all things and and simplicity if someone were to ask in this building, if you were all here with me right now, and someone were to ask me, hey, could you direct me to the restroom? That could be an urgent request. So I would answer in as simple a way as possible. I wouldn't say, why yes, if you proceed eastward down this aisle, on this brown carpet manufactured by the Mohawk Company, on a foundation poured 12 inches thick of concrete with reinforced steel rebar meeting the post-1992 Hurricane Andrew Florida building codes, and then turned 90 degrees toward the south while in the foyer, foyer is a French word, by the way, adapted to English during the building of the great European cathedrals, at that 90 degree turn, you will then see appropriate gender-based signage, and then you can make a binary decision directing you to the facilities that you require. I would never say it like that, except by way of example. I would say, go down the aisle and hang a right. That would be enough. We all do that all the time. Why can't we apply that even in terms of how we do and practice church? To cut to the chase. To jettison all that is unnecessary. So if I ask you, what time is it? I'm not asking you to explain to me how to build a clock. If I ask you, where is the water fountain, I'm not asking you to explain the aqueduct system of the ancient Roman world. There is no reason in the southern parlance that I grew up in to reach around your own elbow to scratch your backside. The shortest distance between two points is still a straight 
line. And it's more than a principle. It's a way of looking at ourselves, our work, our relationships, and especially our faith. And it brings me to a second feature about simplicity, organizational simplicity. Here I wish we had more time to talk about William Ockham. Not everyone appreciates him, not everyone is a fan, but he was one of the first Europeans to write about accountability of the monarch, about democratic government, and maybe, depending on how you interpret some of his old English writings, the very first Catholic to bring up the subject of separation of church and state. He cast a long shadow, but missed in all of that is an obvious overlooked fact. Ockham was a theologian by trade. He was an English churchman. Why haven't we applied his philosophy of simplicity to the subject and entity he knew best, the church? I have a whole series of why questions. These are theoretical, of course, but I still ask them even though they may not have easy answers. I've asked why questions my entire life. It's led me to great discoveries. It's led me to great frustration. I think it will probably be the same with these questions. Why? Why do so many churches make it so hard to get in and so easy to leave? Why do so many churches build massive theological explanations of their beliefs but spend so little energy living those beliefs? Why do some denominational structures and theologies still mirror the feudal system of Western Europe, exchanging bishops for kings, cardinals for Caesars? Why do some churches need enough organizational documents and charts to fill a shelf of three ring binders? Why does a church of 200 people need 25 committees? Why do some pastors demand more commitment to their institution than to Jesus? Why does the church drain people of their energy instead of inspiring them and freeing them? Why are church structures so brittle, so set in stone? Why can't we, the children of the Reformation, reform ourselves in the way we do business? Why does traditionalism keep us from adapting to practical, everyday considerations? Why are we so concerned with the containers that we build instead of the content of what's inside of us? Why does church leadership allow good people to harm themselves for the sake of an, an, or, of an organization instead of allowing them to live lives of faith? Why do we allow organizational complication to distance us from the people we first organized to serve? An example from manufacturing. Some of the largest steam locomotives ever built were built in the 1930s by the Lima Locomotive Company, Lima, Ohio. The granddaddy of them all was named the Allegheny and only two models of the dozen or so that were built survive. One of these survivors is stored at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. I think you're seeing a photo of it right now. This beast weighs more than a million and a half pounds. It has an output of 7,500 horsepower. In its short heyday, it carried 25,000 pounds of coal and 100,000 pounds of water, enough to power the engine for only three hours. Now, it had all of this weight, it had all of this power, and it could burn through all of these resources, and it took more than 90% of the engine's power just to move itself, leaving a precious 10% to pull whatever load it was carrying. And it became so expensive to operate that it just simply wasn't practical and it was moved on to a museum. And friends, that is an excellent metaphor for so many of our churches today. We have all this sound and fury, steam pouring out of the boiler, gears grinding, but most of the power and energy is spent on ourselves. 
and the expense and the resources that we burn through at such an appalling rate cost so much that more churches are more set and ready for the museum than they are for actually engaging the community around them. It has to be simpler than this. And it can be. The commitment to spiritual simplicity calls us to use severe discretion, careful self-examination to ensure that while the depth of our faith should always grow, because faith is infinite in its depth, we should be vigilant to purge ourselves of all the unnecessary structures that get in the way of our simple faith. And that is today's finale, theological simplicity. I'll quote G.K. Chesterton. He wasn't speaking of the church directly, but we will apply his words to the church. There are two ways to get enough, he said. One is to get more. The other is to want less. With that, we revisit Paul's words to the Romans. My ambition has always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard, rather than where a church has already been started by someone else. I have been following the plan spoken of in the scriptures, Paul says. What a simple, uncomplicated sense of vocation. And it's not the only time that Paul said something like this. To the Corinthians, he wrote, When I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. And to the Philippians, he said, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value (coughs) of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. This concept of being in Christ and in Christ alone is the crux of Paul's spirituality. He didn't want more, as in what Chesterton said. He wanted less. And this kept him forgetting what was behind and it kept him pressing on to what was ahead in knowing Christ. If you take a minute and look around our Congregation, you'll be meeting together face to face again real soon. You'll see that it's a diverse group, at least religiously. I imagine there are a few Calvinists in the room if God has predetermined for them to be here. There are a number of Pentecostals not afraid to be seen with us. There are practicing Catholics who sometimes attend Mass on Saturday night before coming here on Sunday. There are Episcopalians who go to early service down on Highway 393 at Christ the King and then attend here later in the day. There's always a representation of good Lutherans, especially during snowbird season. There's more than a dozen Baptists. I try to keep them separated from one another because when they all get together, I get nervous. There's an assembly from the Church of Christ and the Christian churches. They've adapted to musical instruments quite well. And there's a pile of Christian hippies, a few Unitarians, at least two Buddhists. We all come from rich, diverse, spiritual backgrounds. We've come together, not necessarily to escape our heritage and not to add some other label to our religious resumes, but to embrace less, to embrace a theological common ground, because less indeed is more. So when I speak of theological simplicity, I'm not talking about dumbing down. I'm not trying to find the lowest common denominator and hoping that it will be enough to hold this loose confederation of pilgrims together. I'm not dismissing vigorous theological and spiritual exploration. Far from it. I'm advocating for it. I only hope that 
I can come to the same conclusion that Paul arrived at. That after working through our theological facades, having acquired all of the diplomas and the perfect attendance pins and the certification certificates of, of merit, once we've aced all the tests and we have all the right answers, what good is all of this if we lose focus on the one thing, the one person who really matters? When we focus on Christ, we discover a simplicity that is infinite in its nature and depth. Oliver Wendell Holmes, sounding like Einstein, put it like this, I, would give you, I wouldn't give you anything for the simplicity, this side of complexity. I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. After you've worked through it all, you arrive where you began with the conclusion that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And when you return to that, after working through everything else, you return to it with an appreciation, a gratitude, and a love that you did not know previously. I'll end where I began. Washington University has printed an academic paper on the four companies in the United States most astute at disaster response. The professors there list four companies, Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, and Waffle House. The first three are no surprise. They can do what they do out of sheer volume and because they make a lot of money in the aftermath of a disaster and they have a lot of supplies to sell. But the Waffle House, the academics say, is not a response business. It has little to gain. They do it just because it is good business. The Waffle House even has an emergency response vehicle named EM50 after Bill Murray's urban assault vehicle from the movie Stripes. The vehicle shows up in affected areas to get their stores up and running as soon as possible. Why? Because people are going to need a place to go after the storm. People will need a meal in their stomach. They will need to hear a familiar comforting tune on the jukebox. They will need to feel a little cold air conditioning to tame that hot August air. They need to see their neighbors drink a glass of iced tea if there's any ice left in the county and quit eating out of a can with a plastic fork waiting for the insurance adjuster to show up. Life blows the world to pieces. Disaster strikes. People's well-ordered, boring routines are suddenly interrupted. Storms come. And when they do, people go looking for a little help, a little sense and quiet in all the noisy fury. And you can be that kind of place. You can be that kind of person, that people, if you will do what you do and be who you are, as simply, as basic, and as uncomplicated as possible. This is a portion of a prayer from the late Thomas Merton. Dear God, occupy my heart with your tremendous life. Possess my soul with the simplicity of love that I may love not for the sake of merit, not for the sake of perfection, not for the sake of virtue, not for the sake of sanctity, but for you. For there is only one thing that can satisfy love, and that is you alone. Amen and amen. I come in simplicity, longing for pure. To worship you, spirit and truth, only you. Lord, strip it all away, till only you remain. I'm coming back to my first love.
again today, especially Ronnie, we thank you for that wonderful message. Uh, we'll be back again next week, same time, same place. I'll let you guys know this upcoming week about some of our guest speakers that we have coming up over the next couple months. We're really looking forward to having them here. Remember, May 16th, we will be in person at 10 o'clock. We'll be also live streaming that, so uh, we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to having everyone back here in this place. So we'll see ya. of you.